Jessica. So, uh, hi, uh, I'm Colin Watson. This is a recruitment drive, so I'm glad to see quite so many people here. That's very useful. Um, somehow over the years, I've uh, found myself as the. Oh, there's a little bit of feedback. Okay, is that any better? All right. Somehow over the years, I've uh, I find myself as the uh, de facto grub maintainer in Debian, uh, and I'm also a grub developer, and become that over the years. Uh, and I'm here to persuade you all that this is uh, a fun thing to do, and that you can help, uh, because I need more people. So, yay. Um, grub has uh, it's moved on a long way from its, uh, from its beginnings. It, uh, it's called the Grand Unified Bootloader, which is a bit of an aspirational name, and certainly was an aspirational name back in, back in 1995. Um, and uh, back then, most of us most of us just used it over over uh, Lilo, which was the tr really traditional x86 loader, uh, because you didn't have to remember to reinstall your bootloader when you installed a new kernel, which is really annoying. Um, but uh, even so, quite a few de Debian developers have hacked on uh, on Grub over the years, and uh, nowadays it's uh, it's a very powerful bootloader. Uh, it's been ported to many architectures. It's actually quite rewarding to hack on. Uh, so I'll be I'll be giving you a tour of its uh, of its history and of its design, uh, suggesting some particular areas where uh, we we could really do with help. Now the uh, the Grub project, which. Uh, uh, this is Grub One. It was, origi it was originally just called Grub, and we now call it Grub Legacy. Uh, but it was uh, started in 1995 by uh, Eric Bolain. Uh, he was initially trying to boot some. He was initially trying to build something to boot the GNU herd. Uh, and uh, among the loaders of the day, it was it was quite unusual in that you know you could uh, you could edit its menus and fly and that sort of thing. It had a uh, an Emacs or Bash style. Uh, uh, interface to that. Other loaders usually just let you append kernel command line options, and that was about all you got. Uh, and Grub even then had a reasonably capable uh, command line, uh, sorry, reasonably capable file system interface as well. Uh, so it was, uh, it, it was bad, it was by and large good enough. Uh, so many people adopted it as it was. Um, and of course, it was originally designed for the for the herd uh, to start with. So it it started out with a focus on the new boot method they designed, which uh, which was called multi boot. Um, and the the history file tells us that they were determined not to add to the large number of mutually incompatible PC boot methods. Um, <laughs> yes, well, uh, Grub <laughs> Grub did soon become a little bit more generic and it supported uh, it supported uh, the methods for booting Linux and such like. Uh, and I am being a bit unfair. Multi boot has has been genuinely useful to, to people doing academic experiments with uh, with kernels they've written from scratch or other custom payloads uh, because they don't have to do all of that work from scratch. Uh, anyway, I won't I won't cover multi boot further. Uh, this this is a rough layout of Grub Legacy back in the day. Uh, you had stage one. This was a tiny thing that fitted in the 512 byte master boot record. Uh, it just knew how to read the first sector of the next stage along, stage 1.5, from a fixed location and jumped to it. That was all it could do. It was really stupid. Uh, there was a separate stage 1.5 for each separate file system type that Grub understood. Um, and it had enough that had enough file system code to read stage 2 from an ordinary file system. So it's a usual kind of bootstrap your way gradually up the stack thing you have to do. Uh, the the rest of the the real meat of the loader lived in stage two, and that that included all the uh, the the command line commands, configuration file file parsing, uh, and the code to actually boot a payload like a Linux kernel image, which is probably what we wanted to do with it in the first place. Um, so far, so good, but uh, there were there were quite a few problems with uh, with the design as it was initially put together. Uh, the file system abstraction was pretty ad hoc. Uh, it was achieved by building a separate stage 1.5 blob for each file system that Grub knew about and shipping it in the package. Um, the, and, and the terminal abstraction was sort of reasonable as well. But other than that, there wasn't much in the way of internal expressive power going on. Uh, so it was, it was very difficult to extend it safely. It's, it's hard to work out how Grub Legacy could ever have been taught to handle LVM, for instance, because you would then have to have a stage 1.5 that knew about 
each of the file systems on LVM and so on, the, you end up in a combinatorial explosion. Um, so it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't very elegant in the, from that point of view. Uh, there were lots of PC BIOS assumptions as well. Um, it, it may have been ground and unified, but it wasn't, it wasn't really particularly portable at that point. Uh, Federer did manage to get it to work with UEFI. Uh, actually, probably Red Hat then managed to get it to work with UEFI, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't at all a straightforward exercise, and it was very it was very hacky. Um, so as time went on, upstream maintenance kind of fell by the wayside. It was it was such a pain to work on, and uh, there wasn't even though there wasn't really anything newer that was usable. Um, uh, Nobody was really interested in it upstream, so the distributions did what they had to do, and this meant that we a we have ended up with uh, with Grub legacy packages in Debian and uh, Ubuntu and uh, Fedora and SUSE and all the rest that are actually completely different products, really. Uh, the uh, and I don't just mean have a different patch set in the usual way that you that you get. They have completely different uh, installation and configuration tools that don't that don't exist in others in, in the uh, multiple branches. Uh, so t today it's basically impossible if somebody comes to us upstream to support Grub 0 0.97 uh, because it isn't. It, it just isn't enough of a thing by itself. Uh, you have to you have to figure out what distribution people are using and tell them what to do for that. So we end up punting a lot of that to to the distributions to support. Um, so the, there was a Grub2 rewrite started in uh, uh, started in about 2002. Uh, There's a very rough timeline of it. As you can see, it was a pretty pretty long project, pretty slow project. Um, uh, Yoshinori K. Okuji, I hope I hope I've pronounced his name correctly. Who was the he was the lead Grub maintainer at the time, and uh, he started work on what he called the um, preliminary universal programming architecture for GNU Grub or Pupa. So it's it's GNU. There's a bad uh, pun in the acronym. Um, a Pupa is the next stage along from a larva or grub in an insect life cycle. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'd say it was probably. Roughly usable by about 2007, so there was a long period when when it was very experimental. Um, and uh, my my pretty biased viewpoint is that uh, distributions started adopting it properly and starting to shift it, uh, starting to uh, uh, present it to users properly in about 2009. Uh, a snowball effect kind of kicked in from there, and it became much better quite quickly until we, until we finally got uh, 2.0 out in 2012. Um, so I also noted in here the point where uh, the first non-x86 non architecture port showed up. Uh, that was the PARPC port for New World Max in 2004, uh, because that's uh, that's a very unusual milestone in something as uh, as architecture specific as bootloaders have historically tended to be. Um, by now, if you if you look at some core bits of Grub two, you can kind of see the echoes of bits of Grub legacy in there. There are a few common lines of code, but it it was a it was a pretty sweeping rewrite, and there isn't really much left. Um, the and this is a this is a very large project by most standards. The lead maintainership has changed hands uh, three or four times along the way. It's, it took a lot of forward thinking for people to get involved early on. Uh, so the the design that we have now um, is around a small kernel that offers uh, core features like initialization, virtual file system layer, uh, a module loader. Almost everything's in modules. Sound familiar? Um, there, there's an insmod command to load a module. There's, there's considerable in, uh, inspiration taken from uh, full-fledged operating systems here. Uh, you, you mostly don't have to worry about much of this by hand. Uh, Grub install, which is the main in installation tool, works out the bare minimum set of modules you need to read everything else from boot Grub, uh, and builds those into what we call a core image. Uh, that's that's the rough equivalent of what stage 1.5 uh, was in Grub Legacy, but this time it's built uh, dynamically, uh, rather than all being shipped statically in the package. And also at runtime, uh, the loader will will load some modules into itself automatically. Uh, so, for example, if you uh, 
uh, if you request a command name that isn't currently loaded, then it will go off and load it for you automatically. Um, but this, this architecture makes it a lot easier to construct images that fit into a constrained space um, in, a, in a much more flexible way. Uh, we make very heavy use of abstraction layers. It's rather like the way, n not quite identical, but the way, rather like the way that a Unix-like system uh, presents block devices and file systems. And those are generally composable. You can quite easily boot from XS XFS on LVM on RAID, whatever. Uh, there's even a loopback module, so you can treat a file as if it were a disk, much like we have in, in Linux. Uh, and so this makes it quite easy to do strange things like uh, Im you can embed an entire Debian system in a file on a on a Windows system, which we actually did with Ubuntu for a while. Um, and it's quite scary, but it largely works. Um, this, uh, this design also lets us easily build user space tools from very near to the same code, which is which is very important, and I'll come on to that later. Uh, and as you can see from the random stats at the bottom, there's there's very little assembly in this. It's almost it's almost all portable C. Um, the uh, uh, even the some of the uh, almost all of the C is obviously common. Uh, the Assembly is, of course, more architecture specific, but for the for PC BIOS, we're only talking about four and a half thousand lines, which is considerable, but uh, but not not too uh, not too much of a maintenance burden. Uh, so here here's a brief summary of what architectures we have now. Uh, we have a number of x86 platforms. Uh, the the newest of those is that that you can now use. Grub under Zen power virtualization with with a bit of effort. Uh, the newest architectures are ARM and ARM64, which were added last year. Uh, in in practice, some um, only some ARM32 devices actually work with uh, with this uh, because they require the platform's U-boot to be built with the U-boot API, uh, so that it can act as a as enough of a firmware for Grub, uh, and a lot of them don't ha don't actually have that turned on. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's at least a start. Uh, I believe that in theory all of Jesse's release architectures other than S390, no, it's S390X now, isn't it, um, have at least some level of Grub support, which is, which is pretty awesome. Now, in, uh, in Grub Legacy, the, most, the hardest and also the most common problems we had to debug were... Uh, were problems with reading files from disk in one way or another. So uh, people had problems loading the kernel and initRD because their file system was in some strange shape. And if you wanted to, de to debug this, you were usually stuck with trying to set up something that roughly matched in an emulator uh, and either using just crude printf debugging or in extreme cases trying to attach GDB to the emulated machine over QMU. Um, uh, some some people in the audience may be familiar with this routine. It's not very much fun, especially without a GDB stub. Um, so in in Grub two, as I said earlier, we have uh, we have much of the same code built into utilities called Grub Probe and Grub FS Test, uh, which use and these use the uh, the operating system's block device uh, as a backend. So you can ask Grub to use its own partition table and file system tools uh, or parsing code from right there in user space. This makes it very much easier to attack lots of common problems. You can use GDB, you can use Valgrind, you can use the debugging tools of your choice. Um, Tom, uh, Tom Marble was asking me earlier about uh, F2FS and uh, putting that together in, uh, in Grub2 uh, can be done almost entirely in, in user space. So you can put together a, a new module, build a version of Grub Probe that's linked against it and uh, iterate until you get something that works uh, rather than having to constantly reboot uh, even a, even having to reboot an emulated machine is, is a lot of work. Uh, so a, a similar trick also gave us the uh, this uh, spin-off benefit of Grub Mount. Uh, that's a file. That's a Fuse file system implementation that uses Grub's file system code. Uh, so that gives you a guaranteed true read-only mount uh, using the exact same view that the bootloader will have when it tries to look at your at your system. Um, and uh, it, this lets you avoid the caveats that apply to. Uh, Things like journaling file systems in Linux, which it turns out you sometimes can't 
safely read only mind um, or sometimes the the kernel will simply refuse uh, and it's also useful for uh, things like os prover uh, if if somebody felt the urge to make that you work as a herd translator that would probably be a pretty good fit too uh, now you can't do everything in user space uh, at at boot time grub gives you a, it gives you a pretty nice uh, bash style interactive shell with uh, with runtime controllable debugging levels so you can set the set the debug variable to to various things and that will give you different amounts of spew on your console so you can often try things out and fly and figure out what's going on um, you can do quick miniature image builds using the grub make rescue command that gives you an ISO image containing the version of grub that you're using that you can then boot in an emulator and try out um, and a useful trick is to boot your real life system with uh, with such an image using QMU dash snapshot so that it won't write anything back and then you can see how the how the loader that you're working with will would boot your your laptop uh, without actually risking the possibility of breaking anything um, it's easy to pull out uh, bits of bits of configuration files run them write write new commands there's a there's a hello world command which is about it's about 30 lines uh, so it's it's quite easy to put new things together uh, now, one of the getting onto things that are um, a little bit more involved and are broken. Um, one of the things that was part of Debian's Grub legacy changes was the Debian-specific update Grub script, uh, and this works by trying to guess which parts of boot Grub menu dot list were user modified by way of magic comments, um, and updating everything else to match the current state of the system. And this was it was sort of okay, but it a lot of complaints. Uh, sometimes it was just because people didn't read the comment text that said which parts of the file were safe to edit. Um, but just generally, mixing user editable and automatically updated content in this same file usually turns out to be a bad idea. Um, and we've seen that in, in various other places in Debian as well. Uh, so for, for Grub2, uh, we, we brought this, well, my predecessors brought this system upstream as, uh, as Grub make config uh, and made it generate the whole, th the whole configuration file from a small amount of user edited configuration in etc default grub and a bunch of scripts in etc grub.d. Um, and you can still of course write your own grub.config directly if you like. It's about the same length as it would be in grub1, uh, but for a general purpose system we normally prefer the auto-generated approach. Um, so, so far so good. Uh, just about everything's customizable if you try hard enough. Uh, the problem is you have to try quite hard in, in several cases. Uh, they, they all require um, and anything involved requires editing quite uh, quite complex shell scripts. Uh, if you have to, if if those are changed, then the package later you're going to have quite a difficult merge resolution to do. Um, and uh, some changes require things like moving conf files around to different positions in the in the order, which uh, which isn't going to be handled well by dpkg config. Uh, sorry, conf file resolution in future. Uh, so all of this probably needs somebody, to, sadly, to sit down and design a third iteration of the system that uses perhaps a templating language or something. Um, but that really hasn't been at all started yet. Um, okay, so now on, now onto some things that are still genuinely quite hard. Uh, the PC BIOS architecture has well secreted over thirty or forty years of. Uh, 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 of gradual development, and it's it's basically pretty awful for modern purposes. Uh, the the usual partition table format is is called MBR for Master Boot Record, uh, or sometimes the MS DOS partition table. Um, it doesn't offer any formal space for keeping the bootloader or for keeping boot code in. Uh, you can you can cram a trivial loader into 446 bytes. Uh, that basically gives you the Debian MBR package, which uh, which jumps to a loader somewhere else. Um, and there are a few approaches for where you can keep the rest of the, the, the real meat of the loader. Um, you can embed it in a file system somewhere at an offset that you know won't change. Uh, for instance, you put it in a file and trust the the file system is not going to move that around. Um, sadly, file systems sometimes do move mm. things around. Uh, you might run FSCK, uh, or there are some file systems that will 
do their own tail pa I think tail packing in riser FS is one of these that uh, that will sometimes move blocks around for you on the fly um, and that doesn't play very well with a bootloader that has hard coded addresses uh, <coughs> in in the MBR. Uh, you can a, a few file systems support uh, an embedding area at the start. I think ButterFS does, and one or two others. Uh, this is good, but it's not really widespread enough that we can build the whole installation strategy around it. Um, or you can you can do what Grub generally does now on MBR. You can skip the edge of the specification that sort of doesn't really exist anywhere coherent, uh, and you can use the boot, what's sometimes called the boot track or other names, uh, that's the unallocated space between the MBR and the first partition. And this, make, uh, this makes some people itchy, it's a, bit, it's a bit nasty, it means we have to do some alarming things to avoid conflicts with other software that put things in the, in the boot track. Fortunately, almost all of that software is evil. Uh, there's, uh, <laughs> there, there are a few bits of Windows software. Uh, well, some of them are backup utilities, which I'm not quite sure why they put things there, but they probably have a reason. Uh, the, there are a few things that uh, on Windows that like to put a note in a sector in the boot track to say that they have been installed so that you cannot simply uninstall them to work around their 30-day license trial terms, you need to know to wipe that bit of the boot track as well. Um, and that's all, that's all terribly nasty. Um, Grub actually now has uh, error correction on some of its own code in the core image, uh, so that it can, it, Grub can literally cope with a couple of sectors of the core image being overwritten with completely random data. Uh, and so, <laughs> <laughs> it's horrifying that we need this, but uh, uh, yes, that's, that surprisingly works. Fortunately, this is becoming less of a problem. The, uh, the alignment requirements on modern disks mean that for decent performance, you want to have your first partition start at, a, at one megabyte or sometimes even more, uh, rather than the traditional 63 sectors. Uh, so we, we now usually have plenty of space on MBR, but not quite always. Uh, things are also unpredictable when you have multiple disks. You, you can't tell from Linux which disk the, the system was actually booted from. Um, you can, there are some things on some BIOS versions that let you make better guesses, uh, but it's not, uh, unfortunately, not universal. Um, you also can't tell what disk it's going to be booted from next time. It's not necessarily the same. Uh, the, uh, sometimes it depends on wh which, uh, which order the devices are enumerated by on the PCI bus, even on the, um, from the BIOS level. Uh, and the least bad answer is usually to install to all of the fi fixed uh, disks on your system. Uh, but then you annoy some people who have complicated multi-boot setups, so you, you can't really win. Um, the, the good partition table format, uh, or GPT, is much better. It's, uh, it's probably the best thing to have come out of the UEFI spec. Um, and this gives you allocated code, allocated space for... Um, oh, excuse me. Let me not do that. Right, I'll not do that again. This gives you allocated space for, uh, for bootloader code in the, uh, in the EFI system partition, uh, in a partition type that we were able to safely allocate for ourselves because now partition types are a GUID, they're ginormous. Um, we were able to allocate a one for ourselves when, even when using that on, on top of BIOS, uh, which you can do. Uh, there, are, there are different interpretations uh, of the spec, unfortunately, and this causes some problems, uh, particularly the bits that, well, the, when, you, when you install a system with GPT, you're supposed to put what's called a protective MBR in place that, uh, uh, that means that anything that tries to parse the disk as MBR knows, what, knows that it should stay away and not try to scribble over the partition table. Um, uh, the the interpretation of that part of the spec is particularly bad. Uh, Apple have uh, at least used to have a, a completely incompatible both ways version. Uh, you were required instead of a single giant partition to do the best job you could of representing the GPT partitions in MBR. Um, 
and it's yeah that's incompatible both ways I don't know if that's still the case um, some if you're trying to use GPT on BIOS, some PC class systems require you to set the active flag on the protective MBR partition, uh, which the GPT spec explicitly forbids for some reason. Um, so you have uh, you're you're stuck uh, both ways around on a few of those. Uh, now, uh, UFE is where it's at now for PC firmware, apparently. Uh, even if your new machine looks like it's BIOS, uh, it's almost certainly a legacy layer uh, implemented internally on top of UEFI. Uh, and the economics for firmware manufacturers are much more favourable this way. Instead of having to maintain their own, I don't know how many, 100,000 lines of code base uh, that that have accreted over the years, they can now uh, fork Intel's Tiano Core as their starting point and just do their driver layer on top of that. And this seems to have attracted essentially all of the BIOS manufacturers. Uh, we should generally expect even that legacy BIOS layer to go away soon. Um, the the direction that we're hearing from firmware people is all is all about that, and we need to cope with that. Uh, now, Grub's core support for UEFI is basically fine. Uh, the, it has more or less the set of drivers you'd expect, uh, including relatively arcane things like serial support. Um, now, of course, the big thing recently has been uh, what's called Secure Boot. That's a mechanism by which the firmware makes sure to only ever ex only ever execute signed code in a, in a pre-boot context. Um, now, it's obviously possible for this to go very wrong from the point of view of user freedom. Uh, the FSF uh, calls secure boot restricted boot instead for that reason. Um, but a lot of systems now come with secure boot enabled by default, so we need to figure out we have to figure out how to work with it in the same way that we've had to figure out how to work with all kinds of um, uh, devices over the years, uh, just from just as a hardware enablement matter. Um, but the important thing is to work out how to do that in ways that don't end up impinging on our users' freedom, um, and that's been that's been quite a difficult slog. Uh, we've the community's managed to figure out schemes for this that don't stop you modifying the operating system on your own computer, which is the the important thing. Uh, we, ha we have this working on Ubuntu. We talked about this at DebConf last year. Uh, to get it working in Debian, we need DAC to be able to, uh, to sign bootloader objects that we submit to it with the Debian key. Uh, I failed at pushing that forward, so that would be a great project for, for somebody to take up. Um, if I've missed it and somebody else is already working on that, brilliant. Um, I should also mention that there are some outstanding problems with the with the layout of the EFI system partition, which is UFE's place for putting things like bootloader code. Uh, the spec prescribes how you're supposed to behave on fixed disks versus removable disks. Uh, we follow the spec, but unfortunately some systems don't, and uh, and essentially require the removable layout. Uh, and uh, Steve, Steve McIntyre, see at the back there. We've uh, we've gone back and forward a bit on that. We need some way to select the removable layout and have that actually persist, uh, and ideally detect that this is a problem in the first place, so that we don't have to ask an in incomprehensible question in the installer. Um. Now, more cheerily, uh, a number of non-x86 ar arches are in a pretty good state. Uh, they get fairly limited testing at the moment. Uh, I know that. Some people use them because occasionally I get bugs when they break, but uh, but generally they work okay. Uh, PowerPC and Spark seem fine. Um, we should probably consider switching the default bootloaders there at some point. Um, if you're a porter for those architectures, please get in touch with me. Uh, some MIPS ty type architectures work well too. Uh, Ryan Lorty lent me a uh, a Yilung laptop uh, a little while back uh, and so that I could port the Debian installer to it and I found that Grub was basically fine so uh, I was able to build the installer on top of that and it was a tenth of the work that it might otherwise have been. Uh, there, there's been a pretty pleasing trend towards having new arches include a Grub port very early on. Uh, ARM64, also uh, PowerPC64 have uh, has had Grub working from very early in its life. Um, and uh, this this gives them a pretty full-featured loader with not a lot of effort, so so it actually works out quite well for the ports now, I think. Uh, the 
the most recent ARM64 port, I went back and looked at it, it was about 2,000 lines of patches to do the initial enablement. Uh, now that got to take advantage of the ARM ports that already existed and also of UEFI code. So that helped a lot, but, uh, but still I think it indicates a pretty porting friendly design. Okay, so if I haven't persuaded you already, why do we default to Grub on Debian x86? There are, there are certainly other loaders. There's the venerable Lilo, which still largely works fine. Uh, SysLinux and friends are actively maintained by some very smart people who, um, including folks who maintain the Linux boot protocol. And there's xlinux is one of that family, which you can use on, uh, in the same kind of way that you might use Lilo. Uh, there's Yaboot and PowerPC and so on and so forth. Uh, you can even boot a kernel and an int ramfest directly from the UFE environment if you want to. Uh, so some of those are pretty good bootloaders. They're, they're almost all smaller and simpler than Grub, and that explains that, that appeals to a lot of people. Um, and I, get, uh, I do get the sim simplicity argument. But uh, I tend to argue that the, that the result of that is actually moving a good deal of complexity elsewhere. So the, the installer, if, if you have a bootloader that can only handle some setups, the installer needs to know what those setups are. It needs to forbid you from doing anything that you won't be able to boot uh, in your partitioner. Um, you end up with slash boot partitions scattered everywhere. Uh, having, a, having a bootloader that you can trust to handle almost anything uh, means that you don't have to think too hard when you're running things around. Oh, sorry, when you're moving things around. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll come to you in a sec, Ben, thanks. Um, you, you can easily do things like having the bootloader notice when the last boot failed and behave differently. Uh, all, that, all that sort of thing is useful for a general purpose distro to be able to assume. First, they can only load the kernel, and so for that reason, the kernel configurations we've used on MIPS have had to be restricted, mm -hmm. so that um, they don't assume there's an init RAM and you can't and you can't uh, you can't boot off um, file systems other than X two, three, and four. That's and so Colo, is it, or Sybil? I don't know. One of those. We, recently, we have recently uh, uh, made it switched over, but that has been a restriction uh, up to and including Wheezy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that's uh, useful ammunition. Um, I, think that, I, I think that we do not yet have Grub working on all of the MIPS big Endian architectures. It's working on little Endian, but I think uh, there are still some problems in big Endian. So we maybe can't save the world just yet, but it might not be too far off. But thanks. Uh, and, and plus, Debi Debian runs on, on lots of architectures. Generally, we try as a as an architectural thing, we try to run the same software across different architectures so that it all works kind of the same way. Uh, we have the same interfaces, the same tools are available, and so on. And uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense to have that be the case with the bootloader too. Uh, the installer would certainly be simplified by being able to assume that Grub mount is available on all architectures, for instance. Okay, so. Um, the important bit of this, uh, we've had a lot of people involved over the years, uh, too many to name, I've almost certainly missed some, uh, Robert Milan and uh, uh, Felix Zilke and Jordi Malach have done excellent jobs in Debian uh, a few years ago, uh, and Vladimir Servanenko does a great job as the upstream maintainer. Uh, but uh, as far as Debian maintenance goes, it's mostly just me at the moment, uh, and has been for the last couple of years, and I can't do it all. Uh, we'd, we'd probably have had Grub 2 in 2.00 rather than 1.99 in Wheezy, uh, if we'd had a bit more redundancy there. I was kind of demotivated by the secure boot stuff at the time, so ended up putting it off until it was too late. Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing where having more people involved is helpful. Uh, there are lots of bugs. Everybody's boot problem is critical for them, quite understandably. Uh, so keeping on top of the release critical list is absolute murder. Uh, there are, but there are a few specific problems I'd like to highlight that are more, uh, more substantial and could really do with somebody uh, sitting down and thinking quite hard. Um, 
I won't go into too much detail because I've just had a sign from the video team that I'm low on time, uh, but you can ask me about any of them if you're interested. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the system for generating the config file has a bad case of second system effect and really needs a third system to make it easier to, <laughs> <laughs> to make it easier to customize things. All problems can be solved by another rewrite, right? Um, uh, on MBR systems, we often have robustness of problems with Grub not installing its boot code to the place where your system actually boots from, uh, particularly when multiple disks are involved. This, this tends to manifest as uh, module loading failures, because what happens is that over time the core image that you're actually using that you, th that you didn't know about becomes incompatible with new Grub modules, uh, because the ABI changes over time. Uh, and uh, eventually becomes incompatible and can't boot anything. Uh, there are, uh, and I, I think that that needs some kind of overhaul somewhere, although I'm not quite sure where. Uh, there are the remaining bits of UEFI, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's uh, getting signing sorted out in Debian, getting a thing called Mock Manager, which is part of, uh, part of a separate project called Shim, nicely integrated to give users control over the whole signing process, which will let us uh, require signed kernels under secure boot and thus make Matthew Garrett want to kill me a little bit less. Um, <laughs> And uh, the, there's the issues with, uh, with EFI system partition layout. Uh, there's some work to be done with Upstream Zen. Uh, excellent. <laughs> both in the audience. <laughs> but uh, uh, to, to uh, I've, I've discussed this with Ian Jackson in the past, to, to lay out effectively a new boot protocol for PVGrub2 so that we can have Zen guests uh, install a bootloader in a consistent place in the file system. In fact, Ian Campbell recently sent me a something which might be useful for this when I have time to read it. Um, and hopefully this will eventually let us kill off all of the old strange things that live in, in Zen to do this. Uh, and uh, finally, we should take much better advantage of Grub's ports and uh, actually switch over to them by default on many more architectures than we, uh, than we have done today. So, well, I just got onto questions, so excellent. Um, one of the things that um, I found... Uh, there's a microphone coming up. One of the things I found difficult in getting to grips with Grub 1 and Grub 2 is that the documentation hasn't always been as good. <laughs> uh, Lilo was exceptional in that it came with a, an extremely good document which described its principles of operation and how <laughs> to get it to do, well, almost anything you might want it to. <laughs> um, is that also something you're looking for help with? Yes. Uh, about a year or two ago, I went through and tried to start systematically documenting all of the grub commands and overhauling some other things, and got about halfway through that before I ran, ran out of time. Um, but one of the, one of the problems was, has been with grub2 that the documentation got out of date during the rewrite, and thus nobody has an incentive to do it properly for their, for their incremental changes. Uh, so. I think getting getting that into ship would make it much easier to keep it in ship. Um, it's better than it was in 2010. It's not where it should be. So yes. Anybody else? Uh, anything from IRC as well? For Tom. So this is. Uh, Sort of a, uh, a related question to your comment earlier about how BIOSes are wildly inconsistent about how they choose which disk they're going to boot from. Um, is there anything that Grub could do to help us with uh, uh, best practices for failover uh, configuration? So, for example, let's say I have a server and I want to install two disks that are mirrored and you know uh, use LVM or something else. And one of the challenges is you know how do I configure Grub on both disks to do to be configured the right way, despite all of the weirdness with BIOSes, but have a, a reasonably easy to maintain setup where if one disk actually goes completely offline that the system could automatically reboot. Right. One of the, th one of the things that I tried to do the, the first time I systematically attacked this in Debian Grub, the uh, thing I tried to do was to uh, uh, arrange that we did by UUID, I think, install to, uh, to disks. Uh, possibly as by path, I forget. Uh, so 
uh, we encourage people to install to all of the disks on the system. Uh, I think this, um, sorry, also the, p the Grub PC post notices when a disk has gone away since it last checked and uh, it's supposed to offer you the the chance to update this. Uh, but you're right, it's, it's a little bit fiddly to manage, particularly if, if, if you're in a system that is large enough that statistically disks are failing quite often, um, then this is a problem. Uh, and what I, I think what I'd probably like to do is, is make sure that we install to the disks that are associated with a RAID device or something so that you could just bootstrap off the RAID management. I think some of that works, but isn't hooked up very well in Debian. Uh, there are, but there are several things to do there, and uh, uh, I think there's also a bug in the in DI where it doesn't install to all of the fi fix all of the fixed disks on your system, but only one. So there, are, yeah, there are several things to fix there. There's a question over there. I think my question could be summed up as like, how tall do you have to be to ride this ride? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 sure. it seems like getting started, it seems like introducing regressions would be a really scary thing for someone who wanted wanted to get started with the project. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what kind of facilities do we, you have for before we actually up, upload a new version to uh, test mm -hmm. across a broad range of architectures? Right, well, one of, the, one of the points of this talk was to try to emphasize that you don't actually have to be as tall as people think you do. Uh, the, but you're right about the, the need for regression testing. Um, one thing that really helps is that uh, the different parts of Grub are much more isolated <coughs> now than they used to be. So you can, you can quite easily change one module, test changes to that without having to worry about strange leakage all over the place. But there are things that that doesn't cover. Uh, there is um, there is some uh, boot testing uh, arrangements in the build system, so there's, there are some uh, make targets that go off and do boot checks of, of real systems uh, yeah. against, the, against the current version of the code, uh, and that sort of thing helps a lot. Uh, I would like to have Grub hooked up better to uh, some kind of auto package test arrangement so that it does uh, emulated boots across various types of systems on ci.debian.net. Uh, I'd love help with that. Steve. Um, now, of course, UEFI, there's a whole slew of things. I mean, as Tom, Tom was asking, of course, about MBR and uh, reliable fallback, uh, of course. I'm not aware of any uh, UEFI implementations that actually do fallback for the system partition either. Nor so that's a, a utter you know, train wreck. Yeah. Um, I suspect what you're maybe you're meant to use hardware red or yeah, something. It, it clearly, so that's what people what you expected to use, and it's a mess. Yeah. Um, we should definitely get together and talk about uh, the removal media path. Yeah. And. Again, there isn't a good answer, but let's try and make it as not crap as we can. Yeah, do you know of any way to detect that, uh, that system, even if it's something like a blacklist of broken I think that's all, that, I think that's all we can do. I mean, so. we had a system, I mean, I think uh, Leif and I spoke to you about mm -hmm. this. You know, as an example for the people who may not have come across this, there are firmware implementations out there which on straight after install may not actually recognize that you've put Grub into the path where you're meant to put it. Yeah. Um, once you've booted off a rescue system, however, and done some not particularly well understood sequence of things, in, in, including booting off a movable media path, reboot a couple more times, shuffle things around, you know, like spin <laughs> twice <laughs> clockwise, <laughs> suddenly they then will recognize that you've put them in the, well, God forbid you ever want to update it again. It's, it's yeah. painful. There are some exciting problems on Apple Macs that are a shadow of the same class of problem. Yeah. yeah. And of course, Secure Boot. Um, Kibby asked even about this a, f uh, a few days ago. Of course, we've been talking about this for like two years. Yeah. I know. And yeah, I know. It's. It, I feel 
rubbish as well that we haven't really got any further with it. If somebody really, really wants to help get involved in that, oh, absolutely, there's a whole load of people who'd love to see you help. Uh, um, not only are there a whole load of people who'd like to see you help, but there's actually roughly a roadmap for what needs to be done. It's yeah. not you don't have to blaze a trail. Just it's take, uh, take the names off the roadmap and put your name there. Uh, <laughs> right, I mean, it's fine, we don't really care, <laughs> we just want to see it done, and uh, there are, uh, the, the things that need to be done are, um, as I say, the, the next step I think is in DAC, um, and then somebody needs to chess up uh, getting Shim into Debian with the right kind of signatures on it and so on, but uh, none of it is actually fundamentally hard, it just requires time to push all of that forward. Exactly. So, I'll yeah, pass on like I say, recruitment else. drive. Actually, we're, we're out of time, so. Okay. Thank you all very much. <laughs> if if uh, people in the back of the room could vacate at least temporarily so other people can get out, that would be cool. So, do we have to Thank you. Yes. Sorry, no. oh. Do you have one for what? Right. What connections? So, <laughs> what, what's next? PV, PV grub to. Uh, so, in, 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 right. so there is a grub send. There is a grub send bin package in unstable. Uh, the what is missing is conventions for. Uh, I don't know about that. Three, three.